spiritual life, both with our community and individually, um, as we try to draw closer to you, bless our conversation, um, as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Is there anybody here for the first time? Well, yes. Uh, it's a good time to jump in between letters. Every year, I'll just say this. It's my ongoing mantra. Bring whatever uh, Bible translation you have. The best translation is the one you read. So, the uh, Bible's not meant to be a decoration for your coffee table. You know, if you read it, it's good. Uh, the other advisory I have is... Reading scripture and it's not changing your life, you're not reading it right. That we're here about personal conversion above all. I don't want this to be an academic class. It's meant to be one that makes connections with our heart and our own relationship with Christ. So hopefully we're doing that. But this year in particular, it's easier to jump in at different spots because in past years we've done like an overview of the Old Testament, an overview of the whole Bible, an overview of the New Testament, and we did it. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We did Acts of the Apostles. Now we're doing Pauline letters. So they're kind of shorter and there's little intermissions between each letter. Um, what I've tried to do for each letter is give you a little bit of background context of the community that's involved. And that's our goal for today is just to set the background for you so that in two weeks we're going to jump into the text. But believe me, there's a lot of background consider here as a reading guide when we go through this. Um, the one other thing to be aware, in case people have not been with us from the start, we are not reading the letters of St. Paul in the order in which they appear in the Bible. The, the order in which they appear has been determined by how long they are, which is literally the worst filing system <laughs> that you can devise. I'm trying to set an appointment to go and see my, my tax accountant this week, but I, I think to myself, if I brought to her my records based on the length of receipts that print out from the cash register, it's a pretty poor filing system. Um, and yet that's what the Bible has done for whatever reason. Romans appears first because it's the longest, and then Corinthians, and et cetera. But it, I guess I was slow on the curve even thinking about this because traditionally the way Paul's letters are taught in seminary, unfortunately, is the way they appear in the table of contents of the Bible as well. But it occurred to me about 10 years ago, after doing the Bible timeline, maybe the better way to do this, just to see if we learn something new, is to the best of our ability, try to read them in the order in which St. Paul wrote them, chronologically, and see the development of his thinking. So that's what we've been doing. Up to now, we have short recap. We've done the letter to the Galatians, which I I credit as being the oldest um, letter. Some people think it's the second oldest behind the Thessalonians. Just depending on one assumption that people would make, um, St. Paul established two different communities in Galatia, Southern Galatia, Northern Galatia. Southern Galatia, the first missionary journey, and Northern Galatia, the second missionary journey. And depending on who you think he's writing to, you might have a different date. But anyway, Galatians, we, we talked about it. It's a very primitive theme. It dealt with how do we treat Gentile converts to Christianity? Do they need to first become Jews in order to be grafted onto the tree of life, or can they just go directly to Christian covenant, and this letter was written around the same time as the Council of Jerusalem and Acts of the Apostles to determine that, but uh, that's what that letter is about, how, how we are joined into this covenant. Then came Thessalonians, and it was also dealing with a very primitive question. Many people have heard about the second coming of Christ, but yet it was not 
happening. The, the world had not yet come to an end, and people were anticipating it would be very soon, in their own lifetime, certainly. Um, and so some people had stopped living, basically, stopped carrying on their duties and responsibilities, and those letters address how we should understand God's timing versus our timing, and carrying out our duties uh, in life. And then we just covered, well, I should say, Thessalonians is two letters, so the first one um, dealt with this topic, and it actually raised more questions than it answered. So St. Paul had to write a second letter to go more specifically into the end of the world and how we understand how the end of things is going to come about. And then uh, Corinthians came up, which we just finished, first and second Corinthians. First Corinthians was about the first ever self-inflicted wounds. The, you know, previously, the issue was about false teachers and uh, you know, that were causing confusion in communities. Uh, in Corinth, the issue was the conflict and division amongst the believers, various forms of it, and how scandalous that was. And so the first letter, the first Corinthians is very harsh and scolding because St. Paul saying, this is not how I taught you as your founder. You need to do better than this. And then the second letter, he softens the blow with an emotional letter saying, but you know I love you, right? <laughs> Basically. Uh, my goal for any of this, if, you know, depending on your background, grab what you can, but at a minimum I would like to hope at least that you know, you hear a certain passage and maybe you can identify the letter. That's what I'm hoping. Like, if you say, it is when I'm weak that I'm strong, I'm going to say 2 Corinthians. If you say, we are one body, the body of Christ, I'm going to say 1 Corinthians. If you say, those who shall not work shall not eat, I'm going to say Thessalonians. You know, that kind of idea, hopefully some of the gold nugget quotes, maybe you can um, do a better job of pinning down based on the context of the quote. If you already started there, then my hope is that you might be able to narrow down the chapter. At least say it's the first part of the letter or the second part, or maybe you can pin down the chapter because you loosely know the, the structure of the letter. If you're already there, maybe you can get to chapter and verse, that kind of idea. But basically just reach for the next rung of the ladder from where you are. Does that make sense to people? Okay. So we're diving in now to Romans. And it, this is considered... This is going to be the hardest one for background because it's considered St. Paul's masterpiece. Uh, this was one that he wrote during his third missionary journey. He did three major journeys. He probably thought he was going to do a lot more than that, but his life was cut short by martyrdom. Um, but this is going to be the test of how much you remember from the other letters because there's a synthesis of the theology of the other letters that are contained in this. Uh, as you might expect, some, you know, their theological thinking gets more advanced and nuanced. Um, but I will just start by highlighting a couple of a couple of points. So, first of all, three major missionary journeys. If you read the Acts of the Apostles with us, you know they did a preliminary fundraising trip. I consider kind of the training wheels of missionary journeys. But we know that Saint Paul went on three major missionary journeys. The first one was with Barnabas. And the second and third ones, his principal partner was a guy named Silas. Um, we know roughly the years. Uh, you can jot that down and note yourself if that's of interest to you. Um, uh, it's my belief that um, St. Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians just at the end of his first missionary journey after the Council of Jerusalem, which was dealing with the same problem. Um, the second missionary journey um, is when some people think he wrote Galatians, if you, if you prefer the later date, then first and second Thessalonians were written during that time. And then the third missionary journey he wrote first and second Corinthians from Ephesus, the letters we just finished, and he wrote Romans during this time also. Um, what are some of the unique aspects of this letter? Well, first of all, this is the first time that St. Paul wrote a letter to a community that he neither founded nor had ever visited. 
fact, we don't even have, although we know from Acts of the Apostles that, that uh, Paul was a Roman citizen, we have no evidence that he ever visited Rome in his life prior to Acts chapter 28. His life ended in Rome, you know. He was brought there under, under house arrest, and he awaited a trial, which ultimately ended in his beheading. But prior to that uh, event in Acts chapter 28, we don't know for sure if he's ever been there. So he's breaking his own rule by writing to this community as a complete outsider. Um, one of the aspects that I would just highlight is I, I jotted down chapter verse Romans, chapter 15, verse 20. Um, there's a little hint of his normal philosophy when it comes to visiting communities or having communications with communities. Um, he says in that passage, that thus he was making it, he said, I'm making it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on another man's foundation. So, I don't know if you consider that professional pride or not, or, or why he thought that way, but he strongly felt he didn't want to follow in someone else's wake. He, he wanted to be the first one to scatter the seeds of the gospel. So if, if another apostle, if another missionary had already been to that place, as he avoided going to those places. He wanted to break new ground always. Um, so up to now, these three missionary journeys, we know that every place he established communities, he was the very first one to bring the good news. Um, in this case, that's impossible because our best knowledge of the community in, in Rome, the Christian communities, it was founded probably no later than 40 AD. And he wrote this letter, we think, in about 57 AD. So nearly two decades after Christianity came to Rome. A lot of developments, a lot of things can happen at that time. How, how did Christianity get to Rome? We would say it's Catholics. Other Christian traditions, other, you know, Protestant Christianity, a lot of churches claim we don't know how it got there. We say confidently it was Peter. Uh, Peter was the, uh, I've said this before, but just to maybe remind people, from a historical standpoint, we consider Peter to be the first bishop of Jerusalem, first of all, because Jesus said, you are Peter and on this rock I'll build my church. You are the leader of the twelve. We, have, we consider all the apostles to have the status of bishop. But because Peter was the head of them, we credit Peter with being the first bishop of Jerusalem. And then when St. Paul, or previously known as Saul, when he started persecuting Christianity in Jerusalem, actually the apostles described that most of the Christians fled Jerusalem to save their life because those who he arrested, presumably, were executed. Most of them were put to death. They were martyrs. So most of the Christians, including most of the apostles, left Jerusalem and went to a city called Antioch. Uh, actually, the apostle says this is the, this is the first place we were referred to as Christian. The only bishop we think historically stayed in Jerusalem was James the Less. Um, who died, he, we consider James to be the second bishop of, of Jerusalem. He's the one who wrote the letter of James in the Bible. Um, he was martyred. He was thrown off the, uh, the tower, the top of the Jewish temple, and stoned and clubbed to death. Um, so he died in martyr in Jerusalem. Everyone else fled to Antioch, including Peter. So we also consider Peter to be the first bishop of Antioch, um, and then the last we hear of Peter in Acts of the Apostles, he's 
come down to the eastern shores of the Mediterranean Sea, and he's taking a, a snooze, uh, an afternoon nap on top of the roof to catch a little breeze probably off the sea, and he's given this vision by God of, 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 of a boat sail that's catching all these unclean foods. And uh, it's, uh, he hears God's voice saying, you know, what I've made is not unclean. Um, and he thinks it's uh, a temptation to break kosher diet. And he said, I've never done that even from my childhood. But he comes to understand what God is really saying to him is this good news I have is not just for the Jews. It's also for the Gentiles. It's for all the peoples of earth. And I've made all these people. They are worthy to hear this good news. And he, at the same time, he has this vision. Cornelius, who's a Roman centurion, sends representatives to find Peter and lead him to his house. And ultimately, well before um, St. Paul starts preaching to the Gentiles, Peter is the first one, actually, to preach to the Gentiles. He, he has a conversion of Cornelius, his entire household. He baptizes all of them. That's where scripture leaves off. We don't know anything about Peter, but we know it from sacred tradition. Thankfully, as Catholic, Christian, we're not just bound to the Bible. We also have non-biblical sources, and we have a, a sacred tradition we keep up. And we know that Cornelius was the commanding officer of a city called Caesarea Maritima, who some of us pilgrims visited. It's a place where Pontius Pilate lived. It's a place where Herod the Great lived. They didn't uh, choose to reside in Jerusalem. They liked the seashore, the milder temperatures and whatever. Um, anyway, uh, it was the only it was the only um, dredged out bay or port suitable for you know large navies of ships, large vessels. Um, and the Roman military, they're not known as Seafarers, their land based troops compared to other cultures, but their navy used that to tr transport troops all over the Roman Empire quickly. They would sail across the sea and they would, they would check in at this city. Cornelius was the commander of that place, and where our history takes over is that uh, he gave Peter a ride to Rome. And, and the reason why we think he disappears from Acts of the Apostles is he's no longer in the Middle East. Um, so we credit Peter also with being the first bishop of Rome. And he's the one who we think established Christianity there. Um, does that make sense to people? Okay. Is that as early as 30? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saying as early as 40. No, I don't know the exact date. But, um, yeah. There, there may also have been, of course... There were business people and travelers and soldiers in there. It's possible, too, that other people may have been exposed to the teaching of Christianity through travels and brought it to Rome because the Roman transportation system was excellent. You know, highways and uh, shipping lanes and, you know, because of the military uh, presence as well. Um, we do know that Christianity can be traced originally back to the synagogues which, which is the true pattern that St. Paul used also. Um, if you recall from the Acts of the Apostles, those who studied it, St. Paul described this normal pattern of bringing the good news to each new city, first at the synagogue, because the synagogue, unlike the temple, where Gentiles were not welcome, synagogues were more like town halls, or like uh, yeah, the city centers, where people could gather to share ideas or whatever. Gentiles were welcome to come and listen. Um, it didn't have the same connection of sacred liturgies that the temple had. Um, so there were a number of Gentiles who were called God-fearers, who liked the Ten Commandments, who liked the ethical um, model of living, just didn't subscribe to circumcision or kosher law or some of the more unusual customs. Um, so St. Paul would always go there by reputation, he often, you know, they often gave him the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, normally, he would stay three consecutive Sabbaths, and 
and establish a community and then appoint an elder to look after that community and head on down the road. Um, unless he, you know, under special circumstances, he was allowed to stay longer, like in, in Corinth, where he was about a year and a half, in Ephesus, where he was two years. Most of the time, there were shorter stays. But we know that in ancient times, uh, the city of Rome had 12 synagogues. So there was a significant Jewish presence there. Maybe think of it like Chinatown in America. Uh, I don't know that that necessarily means it's a huge part of the city, but maybe there's a Jewish sector that had a number of synagogues where people met. And this is where Christianity sprang up, okay? Questions so far? So Paul, he can't take credit for establishing that. It's been going strong for a couple decades, but he wants to get there. Why? Why is he breaking his own rule now? If he's saying, I, I don't go anywhere in someone else's wake, I don't want to stand on someone else's foundation. Um, I think the answer, part of the answer is found in just a few verses further again. In chapter 15, verse 24, it says this. Um, this is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be sped on my journey there by you, once I have enjoyed your company for a little. Uh, the idea, we think, is that well, I think it's twofold. First of all, St. Paul, even though I've repeatedly said, despite our stereotypes, he's, he did not consider himself a good public speaker, and I, it seems like no one else considered him a good public speaker either, that he stumbled on his words, that he was not necessarily confident, but he was convicted and, and passionate. He, one thing you can say is he was not shy. He, everywhere he went, started city riots. Everywhere he went, he tried to seek the biggest stage. So there's a pattern to these letters that survive to us in the Bible. They're all major hubs. They're not, none of these are little podunk towns. They are they're either regional capitals of the Roman Empire or they're significant cities. They're the biggest cities of the ancient world in that part of the world that he could go to. Uh, and it's why he went to Athens, too, a very prestigious place to test new ideas. But Rome would be, that would be the top of the hill. So I think just for that reason, first of all, but secondly, we think, and I, I'm very confident in this, that he viewed Rome as a suitable headquarters for his future work. Maybe like a lot of us, he imagined he would be doing this work for many decades after, and we didn't realize how much borrowed time he was working on, but to know that at least for, from a Western perspective, from a European perspective, Rome was the, the center of the established world, and they had these highways and these trade routes and military protection, like every day's walk was a Roman fort to protect travelers. It was set up for him uh, to be a strong base to set out from. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another thing, though, just side note. Um, it says he, he aspired to get to Spain. This is not the first time we see this in Scripture, this idea coming up. There were Jewish communities in Spain as well. Um, but he was not, he, he never did get there, as far as I know. Some, some claim maybe he did and came back. I, I don't share that confidence, but... Even if he did, he would not have been the first to bring the gospel to Spain either. Who, uh, does anyone know who we credit as being the first one? James. The other James. Not James the martyr of Jerusalem, but James the brother of John. He is the one. And if you've ever been to Spain, maybe you had a chance to go to the basilica where James's tomb is. He's buried there. Um, used to be, when when it got to be very difficult in the Dark Ages to make pilgrimage to the Middle East, when you risk life and limb and liberty, and you might even end up either killed or a slave, uh, people turned to Europe 
to uh, make a pilgrimage, and the most popular pilgrimage site for many centuries was the tomb of St. James. Uh, the way, if you ever uh, have walked on any of that, there were trails starting from every remote area of that continent that all end at the tomb of St. James, which is pretty amazing. Um, I think, a little side note to me, but it's, all, it's often struck me, I, I, think, I think I have this right, that, you know, James and John, if you think back in the Gospels, the way they were described as, as the sons of thunder, which I've always laughed, it sounds like a professional wrestling team. <laughs> but Jesus, you know, first of all, Jesus is a guy who gave people nicknames. That, that should be kind of of interest, you know, in his humanity, he's that kind of person. But the nickname was because of their zeal. You know, they were, they were zealous for souls. They wanted to do great things for Jesus. And yet we know James the Great, we call him, John's brother, he was the first apostle to die a martyr. His death is recorded in Acts of the Apostles when he came back for a visit. Herod Agrippa had him killed. Um, and when he saw that the crowds were very pleased with this, he tried to arrest Peter again and have him killed. And he wasn't as successful in this. But I thought to myself, that seems a little unfair that such a zealous guy would be so cut short. I mean, why wasn't he granted the kind of time St. Paul was given to exercise some of that zeal. After all, you know, in the words of St. Teresa of Avila, she, she concluded one day when she got dumped from her wagon into a big mud hole, uh, she said to God, this is why you have so few friends. <laughs> but the way you treat them. So I, was, I had a sympathy about that toward James, but then it occurred to me, you know, the, the goodness of our God to allow sometimes our prayers to be answered after our death. Think of how many people came to believe in the Lord from these pilgrimages to his tomb. His zeal, somehow that desire was answered by the Lord in a beautiful way. I encourage you, if you've never been, you really got to see that place. It's pretty awesome. Um, okay. Several C and D tours there. You know, this part of Western Europe was established by some of the other apostles. They, when they went out, they went out to every point of the compass. And we know some of them, their locations better than others. We know, for instance, Andrew went to Eastern Europe. We know Mark went to Egypt. We know Matthew went to Ethiopia. We, you know, we have some of these ideas. Thomas going to India, etc. Um, so St. Paul's not breaking new ground there, but the significance of the city is everything. Um, in the past, I've confidently said one of the unique things about Rome is it was the only city in the ancient world with over a million residents. I can't say that confidently anymore because as I study archaeology, for instance, in Central America, there's evidence now of there were probably a number of other cities in the ancient world with over a million people as well. They just from cultures that didn't have a written language. So, in, in the Americas, for instance, they found ruins in the jungle miles and miles across from the one you saw last week. A city that had eight miles across. I don't know what the population of that city would have been, but there, there were very large cities in India and China and regions of the Americas and other places. But in terms of the written history that we have survived to us, Rome was the only uh, place with that kind of a culture that we go about. And so for all those reasons, it's kind of like how we view New York City and the Big Apple today. If I could make it there, I could make it anywhere. Uh, how important it would be to distribute the faith from that place. Um, so that's where it wants to go. And by the way, it's, it, it, I think it gives another insight into God's brilliance. I, I've often thought this, if you just think of the way God prepared human history. The gospel first lands with the Jewish people, the only monotheistic people in the world, the only monotheistic culture in the world. Um, and then the timing was perfect because due to Alexander the Great, the common language in the world was established Greek. 
for the first time one widespread language that a majority of people were familiar with so that the gospel could be proclaimed relatively easily compared to maybe other times in history and then making use of the the footprint of the Roman Empire with the transportation system how it could take off so rapidly to, to all points in the Roman Empire and you know, missionaries could, could do it fairly you know, relatively safely protected in some ways um, so how God prepared the timing of history for this this thing to bear fruit really quickly, this mustard seed. Um, and St. Paul's a piece of it. Um, so, with that, now let me just give you some specific, here's just a little four point um, thought bubble, I guess, to give you the context of the specific community that, people, that uh, Paul's writing to. You notice in, the end, in some of the letters, he addresses people he, he knows. Um, we know that he knew some people because at the close of his letter, he mentions a few people. Um, but obviously, since he never was in Rome up to that point, maybe there are people, there are Roman people he knew from other cities, possibly. Um, we think his primary source of information up to this point would be Priscilla and Aquila. Um, they were two people who joined him in Corinth. Uh, it says that when, when this is introduced in Acts of the Apostles, they were amongst the people expelled from Rome uh, in the year 49 AD. Um, they're fellow tent makers with Paul, and so they share income and kind of mutually support each other. Um, and they would have been familiar with other people in the Roman church. So I, I think they're the, the likely source of just how big the community is, what kind of challenges they were facing, what kind of questions they were addressing, those kinds of things. But if you, can, if you think about the Roman community, I, I, I think I would break it up this way. So first of all, just to know, it's not so critical you remember the year, but just to know the Jews were kicked out of Rome. But I have Jews in quotations because I think and we get this information, by the way, from Roman history. Um, they did not have a clear understanding that Christians and Jews were even two different religions. They thought, it's pretty clear from their writing, they thought Christianity was a sect of Judaism. Um, so they were not really knowledgeable in the finer points of theology of these two communities. Um, so what I think is that they were evicting ethnic Jews. And some of those ethnic Jews were Jewish by faith and some were Christian by faith because they were, they were converts from the synagogues. Um, so Jews as well as Christians are being kicked out of Rome. And this is the most fascinating detail. It's one of three references to Jesus Christ that appear in Roman writing, Roman history, we think. Uh, it, this happened under the rule of Emperor Claudius, and it cites the primary reason was conflict resulting from the teachings of one called Crescus. Christ from Christus, and it is thought that this is just a mispronunciation of Jesus Christ. So there are there are tensions between the Jews, like Orthodox Jews, and those Jews who converted to Christianity. It's causing unrest, and for whatever reason, uh, the Roman Emperor decides to expel all of them. Um, that's step one. However, in doing that, he didn't expel Christianity from Rome. What he expelled was Jewish Christians from Rome. There, uh, the, the bulk of converts to Christianity were Gentiles. So what that left was a different cultural and ethnic group behind. Gentile Christians, pretty much exclusively. Um, and they had to do a little bit different take on these covenants. They were not 
influenced, or some might say burdened, by some of the Jewish theological understanding. They had a kind of a fresh take on the Christian covenant. That's, so that's step two. It basically became a Gentile faith after the expulsion of the Jews. Step three, though, is that Claudius eventually, as all of us who will one day, he passed away, and his edicts passed away with him. When the new emperor takes place, some of those old edicts or laws are wiped out, and word spread that it was safe for the Jews to return to Rome. Why would you want to return to a place where you were kicked out? I think the answer is easy. Personal property. You know, people had homes. People had businesses. They came back to reclaim them legally. Um, and so they return. And here is where the trouble occurs. There is a, a problem with reintegrating the Jewish Christians with the Gentile Christians. So they now, um, their understanding of Christianity has a, a wider gap of difference of opinion now. And essentially what you're, you're kind of left with is the situation in Galatia. So here's the first test. If you remember our, our study of Galatians, it's principally the same issue. The, the Jewish Christians are advocating a kind of hybrid Jewish Christian expression of the faith, and the Gentiles want to be clean, separated from Judaism, and so a battle ensues about who's correct in the interpretation of how to live out the faith. And so once again, St. Paul is addressing the question of faith versus the law, faith versus legalisms. Okay? Does that make sense? Have questions or thoughts or reactions so far? We're are we a okay? All right. So this brings me to the second part of this, which is very challenging, um, but it's critical. Um, it has to do with the Protestant Reformation. <laughs> that colors this a little bit before we dive in, uh, because this letter is so critical. When you look at differences of opinion in modern day Christianity. There are a great, a great number of issues that flow from this letter also that you just need to be aware of. Um, I, I, was, I, I was meeting with a couple the other day, and uh, they were of different faith traditions. One was Catholic, the other one was evangelical. Um, and I shared this with uh, someone in the last meeting. Uh, I, asked, I asked this person to tell me a little bit about their faith journey. Kind of the general principle I give when couples come together and marry, who have different faith traditions, that obviously the ideal is to be equally yoked, to share a common faith, would make for a much easier life. But that, we don't always control who we fall in love with, then, you know, that's not always possible. But I, I think the foundation of success, if you don't have that, is you have to at least have a mutual respect. So when we have couples who come together who have different traditions, you know, I want to make sure there's a mutual respect and there's an understanding. And I asked this person um, to kind of give me a sense of what type of Christian background they had, what their roots were. And they just said, well, I used to go to Applegate Christian Fellowship, and then I went to, and now I go to Table Rock Christian Fellowship. And I said, so you're a, you're a non-denominational Christian then. And she said, what does that mean? <laughs> Used to be a term used in, in some of the circles to mean, I don't like the labels. I don't want to be called a Lutheran or a Methodist or a Presbyterian. I'm just a Christian. That, that would be kind of a classic non denominational response. But this person who was always raised in that culture had never heard that term before. And I said, okay, well, another word is uh, the evangelical church, we sometimes call it. And she said, what's that? <laughs> and herein lies the problem. I bring it up as an example, not to poke fun of them, I say this with respect, but that kind of a view is very divorced from history. If you just say, I'm a Christian who sort of like fell out of the sky and there's no historical context to how my belief system came to be, that, that seems to me a culture that's not really 
that doesn't really necessarily put a lot of emphasis on historical study. And I just want to bring it up because it's, it's pretty impactful, mainly because regardless of what kind of Protestant Christianity someone comes from, there may be, I don't even know, there may be some here. And I, again, I say it with respect, but you are linked forever to Martin Luther. Um, some people think, no, I'm not Luther, and I don't have anything to do with him. Yeah, you do, because he is the classical starting point, the seedbed of Protestant thinking, and whether people are aware of it or not, uh, the way he thought about certain things, especially influenced their theology. I recommend, a, I just saw a movie a couple of days ago called The Jesus Revolution. It's playing right now. It's just a Jesus yeah. Revolution. Yeah, it's a great movie, actually, but it, uh, I think it's, I don't think there was a lot of theology uh, underlying the, the beliefs. Of I'm sure that's right. People. I'm sure that's right. It's, it's, nevertheless, it's a, Right. Can so I, I want to, in the time we have left, I want to touch on a couple of. Can you repeat what he said? Cause it's I called the Jesus know. Revolution, a movie or a documentary. Come on, about this. Say about it? How about what? Related to the conversation. So, okay. perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, I just want to. Uh, recap a couple quick aspects, especially if you've not been with us for other letters. So first of all, I start with a quote again from, it especially pertains to this letter, if no other, uh, I quote from Peter, it's from the letter of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16 where he writes this, And consider, this is our first pope, okay, right? It's before the Bible is formed. But he's sharing with us something important. He says, uh, uh, So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters, there are some things in them hard to understand, <coughs> which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Um, so the critique of our first pope is that St. Paul's writing style is difficult to understand and many people have misinterpreted it to their own harm. Uh, that always is a good starting point for me, just to acknowledge at least that Paul's writing style is not the easiest to navigate through. And there are many people of goodwill, of good heart, who love the Lord, who can arrive at very different interpretations because of, I want to say, especially add that writing style to Martin Luther. <laughs> uh, so in no particular order, um, here are a couple of things, a couple of aspects um, that Martin Luther brought out that impact how so many Christians of good intention and good heart can arrive at such very different places, primarily because of this letter. Um, the first one is what I would call First of all, I'll write again. He had in, in Latin there was an expression, the solos, the three solos. They're associated with his teaching. And every Protestant Christian I'm aware of subscribes to these. So they are universal principles in Protestantism. Um, the word sola in Latin just means only. Okay. Uh, one is sola fides. Sola fides means by faith alone. By faith alone you're saved. You should write down this, this verse. Um, in, in Romans chapter 3, I'm kind of curious to see what some of your footnotes will say in your Bible, depending on what Bible translation you have. But if you turn to Romans chapter 3, Verse 28. Um, it 
says, my translation is a Catholic translation, it says, for we hold that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. But does anyone have a Bible translation that adds the word alone? By faith alone? If you have a King James Bible, you will have the word alone there. And it will say in the footnote, the King James Bible is honest about it, it says in the footnote, Martin Luther added the word alone. Um, so, you know, there, elsewhere there is a there is a warning for those who alter the words of Scripture, either adding to or taking away from. Um, he, he felt very passionately that it should say, by faith alone, apart from works. Um, that's because he had this, this idea. He, he was convinced in his time that a lot of the problems that were going on in the Catholic Church were because of human invention. And we added a bunch of extra stuff that Jesus never taught. And, and we added this additional homework that shouldn't be in there if you're a Christian. Um, but it, it affects um, how he read scripture. I'll talk about it. I'll go back to it in a moment in comparison to the letter of James. This is a, this is a, well, maybe I'll do it now. It's fresh. James in 2.24, the only place in the Bible where the expression of faith alone appears is in James. And it's this line. It says, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Not by faith alone. Exactly the opposite. Um, there's a, there's a complicated treatment of this. Um, in my Bible, Scott Bond writes a whole essay on it, but it, it's about the idea that context is everything. That St. Paul is writing to people who are new to the faith, who are being led by this act of faith to baptism, whereas James is speaking to a community of established faithful. And James talks about, if you don't have works, your faith is dead. He's, he's urging people to works of mercy um, that show evidence that you have a living faith in you. Um, whereas Paul is, the works he's uh, dis, you know, dismissing are uh, the Jewish laws, you know, kosher diet and these kinds of things. Um, you recall in Galatians, maybe, that, you know, the Judaizers felt Essentially, you could justify yourself by doing all these activities. And St. Paul said, no, you cannot save yourself. Only Christ can save you. Um, therefore, by faith alone, when he talks about that, or if you read it that way, he's talking about specifically Jewish legalisms, that Christianity wants to depart from that, and that our salvation is a matter of grace. When... When James talks about it, however, he's saying that um, properly understood, faith is always accompanied by works. It's not just a cheap word. You should be serving the poor. You should be giving to charity. You should be, you know, living out acts of love in some way that people can see. Uh, there's, there's actually not a, a contradiction of those. But he's stuck on this because it's one of his three souls. It's going to be a problem for him. And here's the second one. Um, sola Scriptura. That means only the Bible. It means, show me where that is in print in the Bible or I'm not going to believe. Because he had a bias to think, you know, again, this Catholic Church is of human invention. I don't trust sacred tradition, what you call sacred tradition. I reject it. It's the Bible alone. Um, we have a, a three-legged stool that protects the truth for us. The, step one is the magisterium, which acts as a referee. The, the Pope and the bishops in union with him, guided by the Holy Spirit. They're like a referee in a black and white striped shirt that in times of confusion, somebody can make the call. This is what we believe. This is orthodox, authentic teaching. Um, and in order of establishment, it's the first leg of the stool when Jesus said to Peter, you are the rock and on this rock I'll build my church. The step two is sacred tradition. Sacred tradition is what Jesus, um, his actions and what he taught us to do. 
um, that, are, that are not recorded in writing, but are carried out in, for instance, liturgy, liturgical practice, uh, and other cultural aspects of our faith. Uh, and I would say that's the second established because Jesus did not send the apostles out to go write books. He said, go out to all the earth and tell them the news. You know, preach in the street, baptize, heal, cast out demons, um, live the faith, basically, be a model. And then third of all, only when the apostles started dying as martyrs did they think, yeah, the second coming thing, that question from Thessalonians, it might even be more delayed than we imagined. We better record this while we still have living witnesses. And thus the Bible began to be formed. But the Bible did not fall out of the sky. We had to consider what books to put in the table of contents. And I like to say, number one problem with Sola Scriptura is the table of contents is not inspired by the Holy Spirit in the sense of it, it wasn't a self-contained gift that fell out of the clouds. The magisterium determined what books would go in there. And I've given this directive before, but based on three main principles. They had to have been written prior to the end of the apostolic age. So before 100 AD, we think 100 is when John, the last apostle, died. So they had to be written before the end of that age. Secondly, they had to have universal acceptance, not just a popular reading in one city, but where Christianity was known, in the known world, it was accepted everywhere as from the Holy Spirit, as reflecting the truth. And then the third piece, was the, the sense of the faithful. This doesn't sound like a crazy story. It sounds like the Jesus we believe in. It sounds like the God we believe in. Um, those are the criteria. But when, when Martin Luther makes this determination, suddenly he has to kick out the magisterium and sacred tradition. He just has this book without context. And um, this is important because for me it'll be point four here, but, you know, um, he believed in something called a sub-canon of Scripture. Versus, um, let's just say the Catholic, I want to just call it Catholic Holistic Library. I choose those words carefully. Bible means library. I've mentioned in the past one of our rules of thumb is we, we determine what style the book of the Bible is written in, and that guides our reading interpretation. But holistic, too, in that you can take any passage of scripture out of context and make it say anything you want. And you can easily, without even so much as building up a migraine headache, if I gave you an hour, you can probably find a contradictory passage of scripture that contradicted any other passage of scripture I gave you. That's a problem. Um, the Catholic way of navigating that is to say there are only apparent contradictions. The, the problem is that our poor understanding of them, but they have to they have to hold us together because even though they use different human authors, there's one common author, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit does not contradict Himself. Um, so we say you solve it by reading holistically, and you solve it if you're still stuck, you turn to the magisterium and say, tell us what is the official interpretation of this throughout the centuries. Um, Martin Luther didn't have that because he didn't support the idea of a magisterium, and he didn't have sacred tradition to understand how saints of the previous centuries read these books. So he said, when the books seem to contradict each other, tie goes to Romans. <laughs> so a sub-canon of scripture means not all the books are equal. Some are, well, just to give you a simple example, I mentioned in weeks ahead we'll dive in a little bit more deeply into the Apparent contradiction between faith and works, Romans and the letter of James. But the way he solved it was he said, I don't think James should be in the Bible. <laughs> so I'm going to put it in the appendix. That's as far as he went. There, there, there are previous guys to him. There's a guy named Macronius who, who said, um, 
I think the Old Testament God is a grumpy God who seems like evil. He doesn't sound like the merciful, loving God of the New Testament. So I say they're not the same person. And the Old Testament is really about Satan. And so I'm going to remove anything from the Old Testament automatically. So there's two-thirds of the Bible gone. And he started editing any reference to the Old Testament from the New Testament. If any New Testament author quoted the Old Testament, he edited that. Then he edited out books that sounded a little too Jewishy. And he also decided for good measure, I'm going to edit out anything that sounds too weird. So for instance, books like the letter of James, books or Jude, or the book of Revelation, which is in the weird category, he just eliminated it and he was left with a comic book. He had like three quarters of the Gospel of Luke, that's it, and about five letters of St. Paul. That's what happens when you don't have a magisterium, you don't have a sacred tradition. But Martin Luther, he did his own version of it, which was, you know, Romans feels like it's right to me. It should be by faith alone, and it seems to be saying what I believe. So that's the, he called it the key to the map. If you look at a map and you see the scale and measure and stuff, he said, if you want to understand the rest of the Bible, Romans is the key. Um, and by the way, the last sola is sola Christus. It, it has less to do with our letter here, but sola Christus means Jesus Christ alone is the mediator, the high priest. So Mary and the saints, they have no role, they have no value. We're all equal in heaven. Uh, if you ask for the intercession of a saint, you're wasting your time on the scene of Deidre, or you could have just gotten directly to Jesus. Um, but the two that mostly pertain to what we are going to be reading, or at least first two, because he used the letter of Romans the way he read it to try and defend this idea that by faith alone we're saved. In other words, and how he understood faith, I should add, is like an idea. If I... If I have a moment of consent in my head, I agree that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, I choose Him as my Savior, I'm saved. Done. And, and what I do morally, what I do with the actions of my life, matter not at all. Once I'm saved, I'm always saved, I cannot lose my salvation. And this idea of sola scriptura, that if this is the key to the map, and everything else that disagrees with my reading of it, I kick to the curb. Um, because of his unique take, it led him in a very different direction from what we have with our three legged stool of the magisterial of the sacred tradition and the sacred scripture. Um, I think that's where we'll, we'll leave off. But it, I think it's important to bring this up because today, they say that there are over 70,000 Christian denominations. You know, I, would think, I, I hope we could still celebrate what we have in common, which is, depending on who you talk to, maybe 65 to 80 percent of what we believe, we hold in common, and to celebrate that rather than our differences. But from a purely historical standpoint, if you maintain, as we do, that the faith was handed on from Jesus Christ, it has to have historical consistency. It has to be able to be something we can trace back in that way. So we're going to try to untie some knots as we go through this letter. And where I can, sometimes I will I will try to highlight where major differences occur. But I, I find this kind of interesting. You know, I just had a meeting with our principal, Kurt Shank, and he shared his family tree comes from the Mennonite church. And he says he recalls really clearly as a child, his grandfather he, he couldn't do this with the whole Bible, but he could quote chapter and verse from Romans. He had it line by line, 100% memorized. And you will find this is a very common thing in Protestantism. If you go to a Bible study, an introductory Bible study, it will always start with Romans because it's the key to the map. And it's going to lead you down a certain set of conclusions. For us, it's just one of 13 plus letters of St. Paul. Um, and we have to look at it in harmony with other books as well. So that's what we would try to take on. I encourage you to read it cover to cover here in the next two weeks. Take some notes if you can. If this is your first 
letter you're joining us with. It's nice to have a little notebook to write down powerful quotes that hit you hard or stuff that's very confusing in particular. So let me go through it. We can tackle it. Does that sound fair? Okay, so next week I want to encourage you to attend the parish mission if you can. Uh, if not, pray for those of us who will be participating. And we'll see you in two weeks. We'll, we'll keep slogging through Romans and the other letters of St. Paul. Uh, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning. It is now and shall be world without end. And may Almighty God bless you, and the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit.